Welcome to Zoom a Scientist series. This series is sponsored by Lake Champlain Sea Grant, UVM Extension, SUNY Plattsburgh's education program known as Watershed Alliance. Lake Champlain Sea Grant develops and shares science-based knowledge to benefit the environment and economies of the Lake Champlain Basin. Watershed Alliance aims to reach K-12 students and their teachers throughout the Lake Champlain Basin. Our goal is to increase awareness and knowledge of watershed issues in youth throughout Vermont and New York. The Zuma Scientist series was created in response to the current need for more virtual programs. Every Tuesday and Friday from now until the end of June, we'll be hosting a guest scientist to tell us about their research in the basin. Uh, as a heads up, this webinar is currently being live streamed to our Lake Champlain Sea Grant YouTube channel. Uh, also, all of our previous and future webinars will be archived there so they can be revisited and used as an educational re resource for the community or for teachers and students. Uh, so without further ado, uh, join me in welcoming today's presenter, uh, Meg Modley-Gilbertson, an Aquatic Invasive Species Management Coordinator with the Lake Champlain Basin Program. Uh, Meg uh, has, uh, oh, so uh, in addition to being the Aquatic Invasive Species Management Coordinator, uh, Meg is a program, uh, New England Interstate Water Pollution Control Commission. Uh, Meg's, Meg works to coordinate management efforts to prevent uh, the introduction and spread of aquatic invasive species in the basin. She has worked for the Lake Champlain Basin Program since 2003. Meg has a bachelor's in environmental studies and geology and a master's in public administration from the University of Vermont. Her work has included the development of a Lake Champlain Basin Aquatic Invasive Species Rapid Response Action Plan, implementing the Lake Champlain Basin Aquatic Nuisance Species Management Plan, supervising the Lake Champlain Boat Launch Steward Program, addressing aquatic invasive species passage in the Champlain Canal, and working with local and regional partners on education and outreach campaigns for aquatic invasive species. She is a member of the National ANS Task Force, past co-chair of the Northeast Aquatic Nuisance Species Panel, and past president of the Northeast Aquatic Plant Management Society. Meg grew up vacationing on Lake George every summer, has a great love for the outdoors and fieldwork, volunteers as an EMT and lives in Burlington with her husband, son, and daughter. Today, Meg will be delivering a talk titled Aquatic Invasive Species in the Lake Champlain Basin. Uh, today, she will review the difference between aquatic invasive, non-native, native, and nuisance species. We will review the primary vectors of aquatic invasive species introduction and spread in the Northeast region. Lake Champlain is connected to significant sources of AIS by man-made canal ways, and we will review how that pathway is being addressed. We will also review the role that overland transport on watercraft and trailers plays in the spread of aquatic hitchhikers, and what steps the public can take to reduce the introduction and spread of all species. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Meg, uh, and you can go ahead and carry forth with your presentation. So welcome. Big virtual round of applause. Thank you, Nate. Uh, does it look like I'm all set here? Looks great. Great, thank you. Well, thanks for joining this morning, everybody. I guess it is now officially the afternoon. Um, I am thrilled to have the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about aquatic invasive species. Um, to start off, we're gonna go right into polling um, with our first question to see um, if you guys can pick the correct answer for what the definition is of aquatic invasive species. And we have a number of options here. Um, a is uh, people swimming in the water. B is non-native species that cause economic, ecological, or human health harm. C are fish that walk on land. And D are aliens from outer space. And I see that um, people are selecting. We've got almost all of the folks have voted. You are selecting the correct answer, um, non-native species that cause some kind of harm. Excellent. 
100% correct answers. Thank you. Um, I Meg, I'm not sure if there's something playing. We can't hear it. Okay, yes, um, that's interesting. So the recorded part is playing and you can't hear it at all? It's just kind of like a muffling in the background. So probably if you actually just mute it, it'll be, it's fine, I think. Okay. So I can't mute myself. Um, I mute what? What am I going to mute in the background? Hold on one second. I think you I may want to move to the PDF version if this is, um, it's a recording for the narrated PowerPoint that we did for our boat launch steward training. So I want to make sure that. Um, you also may be able to just turn your volume down for right now. Um, and we won't get the reverb of, of that, I think. Okay. Be able to hear you. I think that will work because I could barely hear it anyway. Okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. Do you see the right screen now or not yet? Um, we are no. seeing the process map in a dope. Nope. Okay. Hold on. While we're waiting for Meg to get set back up, if you have seen aquatic invasive species, pop it in the chat box. What have you, what have you seen? Oh, here we go. Look at how speedy Meg is. Great. Thank okay, you. so I will try and talk over myself then. Um, so the difference here, we have native species are indigenous species to a region um, that have been here since European settlement. Non-native species are often species that we bring to the region um, that we may want here, like apples or poppy plants um, that tend not to get out of control. And then invasive species are non-native species that um, cause some kind of harm to the environment, human health, or um, the economy. Now, nuisance species is a word that we use to describe almost all of these species. Native species can be nuisances, non-natives can be nuisances, and invasives can also be nuisances. It's how we characterize those species. Um, some non-native species are invasive for a number of reasons. Uh, often when they come into our region, they lack their native predators, parasites, and also have um, limits to diseases that they they may not have in their uh, in their new environment. So they can produce um, if they're plants. They can produce many seeds. They can often reproduce sexually and asexually. Um, they're generalists, meaning they can tolerate a larger range of temperatures, um, a larger range of salinities in the water, and they can monopolize monopolize resources. And they take advantage of light first. So the first plants that we see up this season already floating into bays around Lake Champlain are Eurasian water milfoil and curly leaf pondweed, which are growing ahead of our native species. So here we are in the Lake Champlain watershed and I just wanted to put up this watershed map to show that the Lake Champlain basin exists in Vermont, New York and the province of Quebec. And the way that the majority of species come to this region are in ballast water to the Great Lakes system. But these species, once they come to the Great Lakes, do not uh, excuse me, respect political boundaries. 
So they often move through watersheds or regions um, once they come in with ballast water, and then they can move to Lake Champlain overland on boats and trailers and also through canal ways into Lake Champlain. So here are some of the primary pathways that invasive species can move. Um, so here's a picture of the ballast water discharge. And for those who are unfamiliar with ballast water, international cargo ships take on ballast water to make sure that they're stable in the ocean as they transit. But the ballast water they take on on their home port often sucks in native plants, plankton, and fish. And some of those can survive the transit across the ocean. And then they discharge that ballast sometimes in the Great Lakes system. Um, we have other sources of invasive species. We often have non-native or invasive species planted in water gardens. And if you can imagine the big storm that we just had, where we have thunderstorms that drop multiple inches of rain in a short period of time, or tropical storm Irene and Lee, we have escapes from water gardens. There's also a phenomenon that I like to call the free Nemo phenomenon, when folks release aquarium plants and or pets um, when they become too big or too difficult to care for. A lot of folks think that just letting them go in the environment is the best thing to do for their pets. However, those animals can sometimes get into our waterways and cause damage. Roadway corridors are pretty significant in our region because the Adirondack Park in particular and the inner parts of the Green Mountain National Forest are really isolated from movement, um, but there are roadways that allow humans and traffic, whether it's boats or vehicles, to move invasive species inland to those areas. So you see a, a picture of Japanese knotweed growing along a roadway um, in the Adirondack Park. And then another big one for our area, again, is overland transport on boats, trailers, and recreational equipment. So if you imagine that uh, invasive species can get into the Great Lakes system, as you'll see here, oops, excuse me. Um, here we have 187 known non-native and invasive species present in the Great Lakes system, 87 in the St. Lawrence Seaway, and 122 in the Hudson River. And all of these sources of invasive species are all connected to Lake Champlain by man-made canal ways. So, um, and I wanna also show you a picture of the known of 51 non-native invasive species in Lake Champlain. Not all of them are invasive again. So we have the blue color represents just about 40 species or so um, of species that are non-native. Many are introduced like largemouth bass, rainbow trout and brown trout have been introduced for our use and enjoyment in Lake Champlain, but they're not from here originally. Um, and then the invasive species are the ones that we measure to cause harm. And we've highlighted purple loosestrife introduction as a riparian species, water chestnut, which grows in the southern end of Lake Champlain, Eurasian water milfoil, zebra mussels, alewife, and spiny water flea. And these are known to cause harm to the environment or to the economy. So those are designated as the invasive species. So we come back to the to the slide showing where the canals connect Lake Champlain to the north to the St. Lawrence Seaway through the Chambly Canal. To the south, we have the Champlain Canal that connects Lake Champlain to the Hudson River and the Erie Canal, which connects the Hudson over to the Great Lakes. So we are almost in a circle connected to those larger sources of non-native and, and invasive aquatic species. So just remembering again, this ballast water is how they get from other international ports into the Great Lakes. Canal ways is a way by which they can move from one of these sources to another, and then overland transport on boats and trailers once they come to Lake Champlain is a place or is a way that they can move from Lake Champlain to inland water bodies that are not infested. So here's a picture of what happens when it's too late. Um, in the southern end of Lake Champlain, we have very dense beds of water chestnut. They almost look like a putting green from afar. And you can see um, this team is in there harvesting this annual aquatic plant. Um, so we have management programs that are spending over half a million dollars annually to manage water chestnut mechanically and by hand harvests. 
So it's very expensive to manage these species once they come here. So the best way to prevent them is if the best way to manage them is to prevent them from getting here in the first place. So again, once they get here, we have a few management techniques that we can use to help um, keep them under control. It's very difficult to eradicate populations once they become established. But once they come, you can see there's a photograph of a diver hand harvesting Eurasian water milfoil. Um, we, we also have a chemical control. We use herbicides and pesticides to manage aquatic invasive animals and plants. Um, but these, though these are very specific to the species that we're trying to manage, there can be non-target impacts. There are biological controls um, that are often insects that are tested for decades um, before they're released because of concerns about additional parasites that our controls might have. So a biological water nymph or a midge or a, a weevil could be used to attack uh, Eurasian water milfoil, for example. The challenge is it's not successful everywhere they're introduced because every lake has a different biological makeup of the species present. And though these biological insects will eat invasive species, they will also eat native species. So trying to understand what they uh, want to target. Um, and then we have some um, reclamation options. And again, we, we can do prescribed burning, mostly we're talking about terrestrial species here. And then we also have a do nothing option. Um, but just to explain further some of the ecological impacts of aquatic invasive species, we have a die off of the invasive landlocked alewife in the upper right photograph. Alewife are really sensitive to temperature change and oxygen change in the water. And some of you may have observed an alewife die off on the shores of Lake Champlain. They're unpleasant um, seeing lots of dead fish and they're stinky and they could cause um, a, a public safety issue from you know, rotting fish on the beach. But mostly these alewife are displacing native smelt in the lake and the native smelt are what our salmonids, our trout and our salmon like to eat. So displacing our native forage base um, can have an impact to the rest of the food web. Alewife have also been shown to cause some issues. Um, if, you're a, if you're a salmon or a trout and you eat a diet that's rich in alewife, it can prohibit you from effectively uh, reproducing or transmitting a vitamin um, to your eggs, and then the eggs become unsuccessful. There's also a photograph of zebra mussels encrusting a native mussel. Um, they're not intentionally trying to suffocate this mussel, but the native mussel is a hard substrate that zebra mussels like to grow on. So they will often colonize on top of native mussels and suffocate them as a consequence. So these are examples of how native species can be displaced by invasive species and how there can be um, food chain disruptions. We also see a loss of biodiversity. Um, invasive species are documented to be the second leading cause of the loss of biodiversity worldwide next to habitat destruction. So other impacts of aquatic invasive species, um, many may be familiar seeing dense beds of aquatic vegetation. Sometimes it's native plants that are growing in dense beds. Sometimes they're non-native, sometimes they're invasive. In this case, this is a photograph of variable leaf milfoil. Uh, this is an invasive milfoil. And here it's crowding out native plants. Um, it's limiting the light penetration down to the bed of the lake floor. So other species can't grow there or can't use the habitat there. Um, when we say decreased habitat complexity, what we really mean is that the, this variable leaf milfoil stand is 100% variable leaf milfoil, where other plants, uh, different types of plants might grow. Um, there are some challenges with some plants that can disturb the um, sediments in an, in an area and cause uh, some destabilization underwater or on the shoreline. So some native plants and native plant diversity is important for shoreline stabilization. 
many folks have really dense beds of aquatic invasive species growing and um, warming the temperature of the water and shallow waters and causing negative impacts in that way. Um, and we do see some changes to the pH level where we have dense beds of invasive species or invasive plants growing. The economic costs of invasive species are significant. There was um, a specific study that occurred um, in the Adirondack Park that has some specifics here, but we, we do spend a lot of money trying to protect our water quality, um, trying to ensure that property value is maintained and that tourism can remain viable for fishing, swimming, and boating. This specific study looked at eight different species, four of which were aquatic and four of which were terrestrial, and the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program estimated um, that they're spending about $4.27 million on invasive species management annually, but the estimated impact of invasive species is somewhere between 48 and 53 million annually. There's another portion of this that says that if your um, property is along a shoreline that is heavily impacted by invasive species, either dense Water, Eurasian water milfoil growth or dense zebra mussel incrustation that you would lose property value, value due to that impact of invasive species. So moving on to polling question number two, um, to prevent the spread of aquatic invasive species on boats and trailers, you can follow these simple steps. So the polling question has come up and the options are A, um, do a rain dance and stand on your head. That'll prevent the spread of invasive species. Drinking hot chocolate and eat marshmallows. Clean, drain, and dry your boat, trailer, and equipment. Or take a hot shower and read a book. Um, so it looks like we're getting respondents there saying clean, drain, and dry your boat, trailer, and equipment. Excellent. So that is definitely one of the things you can do to help prevent the spread of invasive species. Anytime you go out and recreate whether you are checking your water shoes or your PFD, you're draining the water from your kayak and your canoe, um, you're checking your trailer and making sure you're not dragging any aquatic plant matter with you. The really great thing is that you don't have to be able to identify invasive species from non-natives non from native species. It's just best not to move water or plants or animals from one body of water to, to another. Great. So we do have science out there and research that shows that overland transport on boats, trailers, and equipment is a way that invasive hitchhikers move across our landscape. And so um, this is why we've invested in the boat launch stewardship and watercraft inspection programs. Many times the boat owners are unintentionally moving aquatic hitchhikers in bilge water or in live wells and bake buckets. And this is because there are early life stages of all plants and animals and pathogens, which can live in water for a number of days that are not visible to the naked eye. And so we can move that water around by accident and introduce some early life stage. Um, and oftentimes when we get plants and other material like mud around our anchor or wrapped around our motor, we're not putting it there. It's getting stuck there and it's our job just to remove it. But this is unintentional typically. So we just help folks to take the right steps and remove these plants and mud and water. And the best way to do that, there is some literature out there that has evaluated the effectiveness of visual inspection and removal of aquatic plants on boats and trailers and recreational equipment. And the science has shown that you and I can go out and remove aquatic plants and be 88% effective in removing the spread of that, of that species. So that's really fantastic. Those are simple steps of looking and removing that you and I can take. But when it comes to small bodied organisms or water that may contain early life stages, we can't effectively remove that without high pressure hot water. And those um, temperatures and pressures have been tested so that we usually spray down the exterior of a boat if it's high risk with 140 degree water for 15 seconds. 
or and we use high pressure and that's typically over um, 1800 uh, psi so high pressure hot water and then a lower temperature to flush out internal compartments and motors of 120 degrees and the cool thing is that these um, features are usually available on pressure washers and we can distribute these to the boat launches and have trained stewards use these units to help reduce high risk vessels from moving or away from or into Lake Champlain and other water bodies with aquatic invasive species attached. So our boat launch steward program was launched in 2004 and it's modeled after the Paul Smith College Adirondack Watershed Institute's program. And they developed boat launch stewardship for small bodies of water with one or two points of access. Many of you are familiar with Lake Champlain and it has hundreds of points of access. So over the course of uh, the first 10 years of the program, you can see a map of Lake Champlain where we station stewards and they're there to greet folks to the waterway, to offer a courtesy boat inspection and to collect some really critical data. And the information that we're looking for is, has the boater taken any measures to prevent the spread of invasive species? in addition to where has the watercraft been in the previous two weeks. So the last body of water visited in the previous two weeks helps us understand where threats are coming from. And then we also ask them where they might go to next to understand where threats might be moving to. And then when we intercept something, we usually collect it and we put it in a bag and we label it so that we can identify it um, either in the lab or in, a, in, um, in our office setting so that we can confirm if the species is native, non-native, or invasive. And you have some summary statistics here just on the number of boats that we inspected over that course of 10 years. You can see that we're at Vermont Fish and Wildlife Access Areas, some New York State DEC, Department of Environmental Conservation Access Areas, and then we've added a few launches in Quebec. Um, working with another partner there so that we're covering launches all around Lake Champlain. Um, and in those first 10 years, we had an amazing amount of contact with over 181,000 individuals who are using Lake Champlain. Um, we found that um, almost in 8,000 inspections, we found aquatic organisms and about half of the time those organisms were invasive. So our message again is to clean, drain and dry your boat trailer equipment and um, to help prevent the spread of invasive species. And we have connections um, between Lake Champlain and all of the other major surrounding water bodies. When we ask those questions about what was the last body of water visited and the next body of water visited, we put up some of the top hits that we have. So Lake Champlain has a really strong connection with the St. Lawrence River, Lake Ontario, the Hudson River, the Atlantic Ocean, and some of those might ring a bell from the earlier slide as major sources of non-native and invasive species. Um, so those connections are real, real and the overland transport in short periods of time really indicates that there's a threat of movement um, along those pathways. We also have really strong connections with inland water bodies like Lake George, the Waterbury Reservoir, Great Sacandaga Lake, and this data does change um, annually, but these sources and are, are go in both directions. So species from the Hudson River could come into Lake Champlain and we could also send species from Lake Champlain to the Hudson River. So we really wanna make sure that boats are clean, drained and dried before they launch and then after they retrieve because it's the point of entry and when they retrieve are both um, opportunities for aquatic organisms to spread. So just reviewing those connections and how important um, it is to, to really reduce the spread before they are introduced. And last year in particular, uh, we had a very busy field season in the fact that boat launch stewards saw um, some real impacts on the launches of um, one of the, the, the last introductions to Lake Champlain, the 51st non-native invasive species is the fishhook water flea. And in the three pictures on the right, what you're looking at is downrigger fishing line and thousands and thousands of individual of fishhook water flea that became stuck on that line as it's trailed through the water. So they don't seek out the fishing line, but when they are 
booming in their populations. They're very dense in the water column at certain depths. And so if, you, if, you're, if you're trawling or you're dragging a downrigger for angling purposes through the water, you'll likely snag a bunch of them on your fishing line. And then when you reel it in, they become clumped up on the line. Um, so we were removing line from, um, from angling boats on the launches. And um, here are some photographs of those fouled lines. And then one of the top, it's, it's the probably most invasive plant that we're aware of in the United States is Hydrilla verticillata. And on the left, you see a photograph um, of this plant that looks very similar to a native plant that we have in Lake Champlain. But our boat launch steward in South Hero intercepted this, um, this plant specimen on a boat trailer before it launched into Lake Champlain. And they knew to look for this plant with a serrated leaf edge, so that, that jagged leaf edge in the photograph. And they gave me a call as soon as they found it. And sure enough, we identified it as the invasive hydrilla, which is not known to occur in Lake Champlain. So that was a save, that was great news. And that plant was coming from the Connecticut River. So um, we have real time results and we're seeing the impacts of these invasives and we're trying to prevent all of these fishhook water fleas on these downriggers from going to other bodies of water and infesting them. And anyone who's spent any time working on invasive species has seen this diagram, but it basically shows the relationship between the amount of area that is infested on um, one axis is increasing and the amount of time that goes by on the other axis and your ability to respond or to implement some kind of effective management um, associated with public awareness. So our early detection programs, our, our monitors and our volunteers who go out and survey their lake annually are really, really valuable because they help create a baseline of understanding of what plants are present and what plants are not present in their favorite water body. Um, so we can keep track, track of that and hopefully identify an early introduction of a new plant or animal before its population explodes. And if we can find it early, then we have some likelihood of containing that infestation and managing it effectively. But as you go along this graph, as the amount of acres infested and the time passes, it's usually not until later in this curve that we can see um, that the public might become aware of a new invasive species. So it's really important to encounter these early in their infestation. So early detection and rapid response are really key to invasive species management. Um, early in infestation, if there's one plant, it's pretty easy to manage, but once it spreads to this level of infestation, it's very hard to manage. And these are examples of purple loosestrife growing in the Adirondack region, an example of what we don't want to happen. So the Lake Champlain Basin um, has an invasive species rapid response task force and it's staffed with members of the state agencies and the province of Quebec. So folks from New York, Vermont, and Quebec, and they're poised and ready to respond within 72 hours if there's a report of a new infestation. This way we can share expertise and resources to go out and either conduct further um, analysis of how widespread an infestation might be and to conduct a risk assessment uh, to evaluate what our management options are and what tools we might have to get in the water and manage a new infestation. There's often a lead agency within New York, Vermont, or Quebec to help take the lead depending on where the invasive infestation is found. Um, and then we do work crossing the borders, bringing um, equipment into the field to help um, respond because we're really treating these infestations on a watershed scale instead of on a state by state or province by province scale, understanding that these species can move throughout a watershed fairly easily. The state of New York has set up a really neat model where they have eight partnerships for regional invasive species management. And these partnerships help coordinate with local partners to have more effective response to invasive species. Um, it would be great to have a model like that in, in Vermont. Um, and then we, 
you know, the, the Lake Champlain Basin Boat Launch Steward Program is part of this larger program where we're collecting the same data and we're training our boat launch stewards in the same way so that we have the same messages shared with boat launch users, whether they're in New York or Vermont, inside the basin or outside the Lake Champlain Basin. And um, the Adirondack Watershed Institute has won or has been granted a $9 million five-year grant to put stewards and decon stations across the Adirondack Park. And we are trying to, um, to sort of emulate that in Vermont and across the Northeast region. There are um, rules and regulations in both New York and Vermont. And in Vermont, you know, there, there are many rules about plants that may be sold legally or illegally. Um, there's bait fish use regulations for buying certified disease-free bait um, and where you can use that bait within the state so that you're not moving the bait from one zone to another zone um, to help reduce the risk of introduction or spread of aquatic organisms. And then there are transport laws um, which state that it's illegal to move water and certain plants and organisms on your boat and trailer. And that if there are boat launch steward programs present and decontamination that those services need to be utilized if your vessel is high risk. Similarly, in New York, uh, there is a law that is um, in effect for all boat launches that you have to, again, clean, drain, and dry your boat and trailer before you, before you float and after you retrieve your boat. So in conclusion, we have um, a, a quick overview that invasive species have a tremendous amount of ecological and economic harm. Humans are part of the problem, but they're also part of the solution. So there's simple steps we can take to help prevent the spread and introduction of invasive species. Um, and prevention and early response are really critical in these efforts. Without volunteers and without folks like you listening to presentations about how to take best management practices to help prevent the spread of invasives, we would have a much larger um, challenge in managing these organisms. We like to say that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And again, um, remind folks to please not release their pets and aquarium fish into local waters um, to help clean, drain, and dry your recreational boats and all of your equipment and trailers. And to follow the rules and regulations that exist to help prevent the spread. There is a lot about this watershed that I care about. Um, I have grown up recreating here and here are a few photos of my children and my family looking down on Lake Champlain from Mount Philo and in, on, and under the water of Lake George. And there's a little uh, video that helps share my love of the water and why I wanna work so hard to protect um, these resources from aquatic invasive species impacts. Okay, so I'll leave it right there and I'll hand it back over to the secret staff to let me know if there are questions that need to be answered. Great, thanks Meg. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, and thanks for working through those technical difficulties, um, big challenges, uh, but really great presentation. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, so folks, if you have questions for Meg, again, um, go ahead and jump down into that question and answer box and uh, feel free to type your type your questions right in there. Um, and we will have Ashley Eaton um, come on and moderate any questions that uh, populate that, that question and answer box. Um, Meg, if it's all right with you, I'd like to start off uh, asking a question of my own. And uh, you kind of already touched on it with your last slide there, um, but I'm hoping you could talk through a little bit sort of your path to where you are now in the work that you do um, and thinking about, you know, I think it's obvious in, in sort of your initial aspirations and sort of what keeps you motivated to do the work that you do, but, um, you know, maybe it's more sort of on the 
academic side or professional side of things, sort of your path from, you know, grade school age to, to where you are now, sort of how you got involved in the work that you do? Absolutely. Um, briefly, uh, I, I did a lot of, um, I grew up in Washington, D.C., and uh, we went out of the city very frequently for recreational opportunities. And when I was at a sleepaway camp in West Virginia, I one of our projects during that sleepaway camp was to monitor um, plant growth along a tributary to the Potomac River. Um, and the Potomac River runs through the heart of Washington, D.C. Um, and at that point is relatively polluted. It's been cleaned up quite a bit, but that was really near and dear to my heart. And I think starting those activities in a younger age, um, connecting the concept of what a watershed is and water flowing through the landscape and thinking about um, where it might encounter pollution and how we could help reduce that pollution um, was seeded, fortunately for me, at a fairly young age. And then my love for the outdoors and being outside and sleeping outside, um, I think, was not a surprise to my parents that I chose the University of Vermont and ended up in environmental studies and geology degrees, um, both opportunities for lots of uh, longer lab hours for, for for classes, maybe not attractive to others, but was definitely attractive to me. And I became um, very in active and involved in the Wilderness Outing Club at the University of Vermont and then was president of it for a few years. Um, just really, really inspired to get people outside and um, work with them on providing them the skills to take care of themselves in the wilderness in all different temperatures and having that opportunity to sort of slow down, disconnect from everything else and reconnect with their themselves. So helping to facilitate that was was a very large part. I when I graduated from the University of Vermont, um, I had five jobs, uh, including working at the teddy bear factory and waitressing. And one of them was working in the resource room for Colleen, who's on the call. And um, that kickstarted my career um, working as an environmental analyst with the basin program and New England Interstate. That's awesome. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it's uh, it's always interesting to hear people's journeys, and uh, you know, since obviously you and I are in similar fields, it's always nice to like see where things overlap and um, just some of the, the work you've been doing. So thanks for for talking through that. I appreciate it. Ashley, how are we doing in in the question and answer box? I can't see it. Um, so we are doing great. So we've got a question here. Um, so thinking about you know rolling into our summer 2020 season, boats are going to be hitting the waters. People are going to be recreating, and so the question is, Meg, what are kind of the threats or concerns that we should be thinking about going into the summer? Are there some species that are right on the cusp of maybe being a little bit more likely to be introduced to Lake Champlain, what are they? How can we identify them and be aware? Sure, so um, just to start off, um, what we really see is that aquatic plants and animals are the first to reproduce and the first to grow. They are really competitive and are able to get that edge and that's why they're so successful. They don't have those other predators that they're competing with, et cetera. So in Lake Champlain in particular, I was at Niquette Bay State Park a few weekends ago with my children and they wanted to go in the water even though it was 50 some degrees. Um, and the first aquatic vegetation that we saw washing up on the shore was Eurasian water milfoil and curly leaf pondweed. And that might've been just from strong winds and currents or from boats, um, you know, go running through beds of those plants um, near the shore but they're clearly the first that are growing. Um, so we wanna be observant when we start seeing aquatic plants on the boat launches and on your trailer. The first ones up may be invasive. Um, so we wanna make sure, you know, we don't need to be able to identify everything. We just need to see it and remove it. So whether it's native or non-native or invasive, please drain water and remove those plants in mud and leave them where you found them. Um, and then for when you know we really see the biggest threats are not until a little bit later in the season. So it's all driven by water temperature and the conditions for the season. But once those plants grow from the bottom of the lake bed and then they top out at the water surface, that's when they cause greater issues and become more entangled or entrained by boats and motors. And we can start removing virtual hand clumps off of motors and trailers. Um, 
when those boats are coming and going from the launches. And there's a lot of ideas around um, maybe setting up management areas around our boat launches to help prevent that, um, that point where the boats are entering and leaving the water from being a place where they're moving so much plant, uh, plant growth there. But the, um, the invasive spiny water flea and fish hook water flea that are both present in Lake Champlain don't really boom in their population until the water is a certain temperature and that's um, a little bit later in July that we would expect to see that. Great, thank, thank you so much. That was a lot of information. It's crazy to think about all of the, there's because there are so many different aquatic invasive species, there are so many different ecological niches timelines for all of these organisms throughout the season. It's really complex to think about how you manage these. And so I'm curious, you showed us that graphic earlier from the Great Lakes, and I'm wondering, um, you know, we were significantly lower than the Great Lakes in terms of our total number of aquatic invasive species. I wonder, Meg, what are, you know, what are the top two, one or two organisms that you probably see being a, the highest risk in the next few years for entering Lake Champlain? Um, I know there's been a lot of talk about the quagga mussel. I'm just curious what, what organisms you might identify that are kind of on our radar. Absolutely. So quagga mussel is the top one. If you're talking about mussels or mollusks, um, we have the invasive zebra mussel in Lake Champlain, but we do not have quagga mussel. And if quagga mussel were to enter Lake Champlain, we know they're present in the Erie Canal. Um, and that they could move into the Champlain Canal in North, or they could take a ride on a boat bottom um, who's, that's transiting the canal systems or overland on um, a boat or trailer. Zebra, zebra mussels like to colonize um, water that you know, ranges between really shallow to about you know, 60 feet is where they're most happy. Um, they can live deeper than that, but a number of our historic shipwrecks on the bottom of, of Lake Champlain are preserved because they're in water that's deeper and colder and the quagga mussel prefers that habitat. So there's more at risk with our historic um, wrecks with quagga mussel. So quagga mussel is, is definitely um, an issue and we know they're also present in the St. Lawrence Seaway and can come down the Chambly Canal into Lake Champlain that way. I suspect there have been a number of introductions already that have likely failed. Um, it takes an amount of pressure of introductions and a number of the organisms to actually reproduce and start um, a population that's viable. So um, we've been fortunate that we haven't detected that yet. If it was aquatic plant, I'm gonna stick with the hydrilla species, which I showed you the sample of earlier in the presentation. We do have known populations in the state of Eastern River and in very small lakes um, in the Northeast region. Unfortunately, a few years ago, we found a very dense population in the lower end of the Connecticut River. And if you trace the Connecticut River, it goes north up through Massachusetts and then is the border between New Hampshire and Vermont. Um, so while that plant likely won't move upstream on its own, there's a lot of boat activity um, that could help move that organism closer to Vermont's borders um, as a threat. So aquatic plants, I'd say, Hydrilla um, would be my concern. And then if it's a fish, it's going to be a tie between round goby, which we know is in the St. Lawrence Seaway, um, and the Erie Canal moving this way through open canal man-made pathways. Um, and a lot of anglers like round goby as bait, which is a concern for introduction. Um, it's going to be a tie with the invasive northern snakehead, which has dense populations in the Delaware and Potomac rivers. So Maryland and and Delaware have large populations. They have eradicated a small population in a New York tributary, not um, as near our region. And then there's the Asian carp concern that's uh, in the Mississippi drainage. And that population is constantly challenging the Chicago Sanitary Ship Canal barrier, which was originally built for around and now is being used for Asian carp uh, deterrent. So those are the three fish I'm most concerned about. Great, thanks for that breakdown. Um, I'm sure folks later can kind of go online and check out some of these, learn more about these species as well and organisms that are in other water bodies to kind of see what else is out there. Um, so we have a question from, one more question I'm gonna have you answer before you zip, Meg, because I know you have a 1 p.m. meeting, but just a question here about 
How have there been significant decreases in the spread since the implementation of the protocols that you talked about? Um, so clean, drain, dry. Have we seen a slower spread in our region than, than others that have not implemented these protocols? And, they, and there's a little, um, some brackets here and they're asking basically, how do we measure the effectiveness of our current prevention efforts? And I think there might've been some of that information on that boat launch stewards graphic you shared. Yeah, it's a big challenge to measure success. Um, the way that we talk about success are saves or interceptions of introductions or organisms leaving Lake Champlain for our program specifically around boat launch stewardship. Um, I will tell you that the larger picture, um, if we can step back a little bit, is that um, the Inter International Maritime Organization has passed ballast water regulations such that now um, vessels carrying Inter international cargo are to exchange that water. So if they have fresh water from their port um, that they're leaving from, that they exchange it in the ocean. And just that change in salinity mm -hmm. often will eliminate any organisms in the fresh water before it might be dispensed into the Great Lakes or another port along the coast of the United States. Um, but once those regulations were implemented, we, we saw a significant reduction of um, new non-native invasive species showing up in the Great Lakes ecosystem. And that's really the source that I think we should be looking at for uh, the location of where new non-natives might come into Lake Champlain. Um, but overall, I think it's, it's really what we have are the numbers of what it costs us to manage plants like water chestnut or Eurasian water milfoil, or try and eradicate a small population of fish or reclaim a lake. Um, we have those numbers and we know that property value decreases, um, but with our spread prevention programs, you can't detect what saves you've really made. It's hard to put a value on that. So we keep just asking for folks to take the best measures that we can offer and that that ounce of prevention really pays off to be a pound of cure. If you think about long-term management of an organism once it's established, versus supporting spread prevention and education and outreach programming. That's great. Thank, Thank you so, so much, Meg. Meg. Again, a huge virtual round of applause for joining us today. And, and thanks for working through some of those tech challenges. Um, Sorry, I was really, kind of talking over a recording of myself. I appreciate it. <laughs> that was very impressive. Um, <laughs> and thank you so much. We'll let um, you zip away. And then we have another question or two here in the chat box that I'll have, or in the q and I'll have um, Colleen answer those after we launch the feedback poll. Thank you. Thanks again, Meg. Uh, really appreciate your time. We'll see you soon. Um, That's good. For those of you uh, who are still with us, uh, actually just launched a feedback poll. It'd be really great uh, if you could take a few minutes to uh, fill that out and let us know how we're doing. Uh, really useful for us to, to get this information from you. Um, so I'll give you a, a minute or so to, to work through that feedback poll. Really appreciate it. Um, if for some reason the feedback poll is not um, showing up for you, you can type any just general feedback you have for us uh, in the chat box as well. Um, just another option for you to, to, to you know, express how you're feeling a little more open-ended about Zuma Scientist. Um, I, all, I already saw some, some feedback popping in there, so appreciate that. All right, and uh, while y'all are finishing up your feedback poll, I just wanna talk through uh, our take-home activity today. So I wanted to keep things pretty simple. Um, there's a, another video, it's about a half hour long. Uh, you might even call it a movie or a documentary uh, called Lake Defenders uh, that was recommended uh, as, as a follow-up resource. So you should see a link uh, to that video coming into the chat box soon. Uh, great, great follow-up resource to learn more, go a little bit more in depth about uh, aquatic invasive and non-native species. Uh, and then real simply, uh, next time and every time you go boating or if you're, you know, fishing in streams and using waders, um, just practicing those, uh, you know, clean boating, that clean drain dry that we talked about, you know, using, using wader washes um, and just doing your best to minimize the transport um, of, of species from one water body to a next. So just a little bit of a challenge for you. Um, you know, to take that extra step every time 
uh, and make sure that you're, you know, practicing clean and safe boating and recreating responsibly. Uh, and you can see our Instagram handle and our Facebook page. Uh, it's a good place to, to share some of those things. Maybe you are moving from one water body to another and you intercept, uh, you find a, a, a piece of biological material that you remove from your boat before entering uh, Lake Champlain and you want to know, let us know that you found that, you know, feel free to, to share that with us on, on social media. Uh, and finally, uh, up next in our uh, Zuma Scientist series on Friday, uh, we have Lisa Izzo joining us to deliver a talk titled Learning More About Lake Champlain's Ancient Fish, Finding and Following Young Lake Sturgeon. So join us on Friday at noon. Uh, there should be a link in the chat to our virtual learning page uh, for you to go and register for that. Also, there should be a link to our YouTube channel uh, to view this presentation, previous and future presentations as well. Um, so on Friday, uh, Lake Sturgeon, sometimes described as living fossils, the largest and longest living fish found in Vermont. Uh, the species was listed as an endangered in Vermont in 1972, but over the past 20 years, increased sightings of adult Lake Sturgeon have pointed toward potential recovery in Lake Champlain. Uh, while we've started to learn more about adult, adult lake sturgeon in Vermont, these fish don't become adults until they're 15 to 20 years old, and we don't know much about where they are or what they're doing before that. So Lisa Izzo, a PhD candidate with the Vermont Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit at UVM, will discuss lake sturgeon in Lake Champlain and how her research uses acoustic tagging to answer questions about what habitats the juveniles of these ancient fish are using in Lake Champlain and different times of the year. So please do come back and join us for that talk on Friday. Nate, uh, can I ask Colleen one, one question, question before we zip, zip off? It'll, it'll be, be, I think, a perfect send off point. Sounds good. Okay, okay Colleen, one, one question just before we zip away here, here round, round things out. out. Question about volunteer, volunteer opportunities with regards to invasive species prevention. So are there any opportunities that you'd recommend folks that are looking to volunteer and get involved? Yeah, Ashley and Nate, that's a great question. Uh, under normal circumstances, there would be several opportunities available during the summer months, especially um, folks might wanna keep an eye on local watershed groups uh, that get involved with uh, pulling invasive species from river banks and uh, fairly recently flooded lowlands and in particular, particular the, the Lewis, Lewis Creek, Creek Association, Association has done, done a lot of work with frog bit and other species in the past and then Nature Conservancy has been very active in getting both summer campers and volunteers down in the South Lake in canoes uh, to hand pull water chestnuts and the Lake Champlain Committee often does that as well on the north end of the lake uh, in conjunction with um, Friends of Missisquoi Wildlife Refuge uh, up on the bay. So I don't know to what extent that will happen uh, this year in groups, uh, but I think each of those organizations will have information posted where you could go out and do it as a family. Uh, in a canoe or kayak. So those would be some great opportunities. And then on the land, the um, Winooski Valley Park District often offers opportunities as well. Uh, but again, stay tuned for that for family activities versus large group activities this summer. Great question, question. Thank, thank you. you. Great, thanks so much, Colleen. Yeah. Oh, and Ashley, we can just add, uh, folks should, Keep an eye at the Lake Champlain Sailing Center. So the Community Sailing Center sailboats this summer because in July, I think you're going to see a new sail relevant to invasive species. So it's under construction right now. So look for the black and white one this summer. Ooh, cool. Thanks, Colleen. Very exciting. <laughs> Awesome. Um, well, again, yeah, thanks everyone for joining us and 